Let me just share my screen. Okay, everyone see that? Thumbs up or uh, an, uh, an audio approval will help too, whichever you prefer. Yeah, we could see it. Awesome. Okay. Everyone's afternoon going well? I'll take that. No answer is a good answer. I'm um, not feeling well today. Have been sneezing all day. I'm sorry, Ami. Hopefully, hopefully, just allergies. It's pretty much that time of the year, so I hope that's all it is. And for everyone that's in participation, feel free to turn off your camera. I actually encourage it just so we can get as close to a real, uh, I should say real, but as close as an in-person interaction as we can get. Still, uh, we're coming to the end of COVID, so it's a plus, but we're still kind of, still not in the clear yet. So try to get it as close to being in person as we can. So today we're gonna be talking about um, the finals preparation. So it's that time. I have the picture of just the light at the end of the tunnel. It's been a long semester, some longer for others, but we're getting to that point where all your hard work is paying off and pretty much about to wrap it up for the semester. But about finals and midterm is a time where a lot of students express, at least that I've worked with, and even my, from my own personal experience is where we start to get, things get a little more different, a little bit more stressful, a little more crunch time. So it, can I ask, does everyone kind of feel that same feeling as well? You can unmute or you can type in the chat or feel free to just give the thumbs up, whichever you prefer. Every day, ever since I started Hudson County. Oh, every, ever since ever since Hudson County came in your life, you've been stressed during these times? Mostly sometime in high school when it's midterms or it's tests during my senior year. Oh, and just to keep you on the spotlight, can, uh, can I ask you what's, uh, what's different about this time, uh, Hayami? Um, the difference is that I think when I'm about to graduate, mostly to transfer to another, to another, you know, to transfer to a university. Okay, so you, it's a little stressful for that. Yeah, because you, um, because you try and want to keep that GPA up. Okay, so it's like the it's every, the pressure is just all mounting into like one one time period. It sounds or like in like one or two weeks. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, I appreciate you sharing, and that's understandable. Can anyone else tell me if they feel that same way? We can do the chat or the thumbs up. Awesome, thank you, Maria. I know for the silence, I'll take that as a yes for everyone else as well. I'm sorry, I just came in. I didn't hear the question. Oh, no worries, Eva. Um, uh, Hayami was saying, and I was agreeing with her, that this finals is a stressful time because it feels like all the all the pressures come to get uh, come to a point with the last two weeks, and there's a lot not just finals, or but there's also papers, and just feeling like a lot more stress. And do you feel that way as well? There are times I do, yes. And you what's know, the, what's I'm the reason sorry? for you? What's the reason? Just well, basically, like I'm the first generation in my family to actually graduate. Um, the first one in my family to also get a, a scholarship for NJCU, the top, the highest scholarship they have. And it's an honor for me to get that. But at the same time, me being who I am, I, I just want to make sure that everything is up to par, that I'm ahead of everything because... <laughs> I am one person for multiple people, you know, for my children, my husband, my job, my work study, my schooling, you know, so it's a lot. But the suggestion that I have that works for me is to sometimes just disconnect yourself from everything and everybody and just take a day to do a stressful, relaxing you time, you know, because I do agree with Haiti. It, it can be, it does take a toll on a person, you know, but at the end of the day, I wouldn't change anything I have now for what I used to have in the past. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing and uh, congrats on all that too. Thank you. Thank you. So it sounds like Eva was saying that she's like basically a champion for a lot of people. Um, feels like she has to be the example and that's adding stress, not just with school, but outside of life as well. And that's, I can definitely relate to that. And I know I, I bet a lot of us can as well. So, but congratulations again, Eva. That's a, a lot of great accomplishments. Thank, and you. Then, Thank you so much. 
Eva even shared how she kind of changes it with um, talking about self-care and kind of having to um, not block people out, but have that day dedicated where it's to her and to her obligations to school. Does anyone else have any input or at least any of their own advice that that seemed to work with them that was a little different of how they change it, what they, how they make um, their changes to make things work at this time, the stressful time of the semester? I guess I could say, um, I remember when I, like being on my undergrad and that having final, I had to uh, organize myself. So I would, I would get like uh, sort of like a calendar that of that month, see you, and then input when things are getting done, what needs to be done, what papers I got to write, how many pages. And then it's like, okay, now I have to like spread out. So I would like, if I had two classes and I had two papers to write, I would like be like, okay, I'm gonna, this day I'm gonna give like two hours to this paper. And then another two hours to the other paper, then this day, and I should have it finished by this time. So sort of like just organize everything. Um, that was the way that used to help me because I used to procrastinate and leave everything for the last minute. So bad. But that, but like I, I, I myself, I work better when it's like that crunch time and stress. And I, I know I could write better. And that's why I guess I procrastinate. But just if you do that, just organize yourself. That's the only way you'll be able to get things done. Organization is key. Thank you for sharing. Yes. But, then, but it sounds like you work well under pressure. Yes, I do. I do. No, I agree with that as well. And I'm a, I'm a madman myself of just pulling my spreading myself thin. So how I change it up personally is just um, I cut out the procrastination, as Maria said. I kind of cut the little social life that I do have or did have during the finals. I would cut that out for those that week or two. And one thing that was key that I, for me, it doesn't work for everyone, is that I would eat healthy. I'd make sure I made it a point to eat regularly and healthy during those two weeks because I knew I wasn't getting sleep. I knew I was going to be burnt out. So if I can at least get one thing in my life kind of on par and at least taking care of myself, it was eating and make sure because when you eat what better and it's not always fast food and fried food and like sugar and caffeine, you feel a lot so much better. Your body, I just, unless you like actually experienced it, you'll understand where I'm coming from. I can't tell you if you haven't experienced it, but when you feel like you're just running on pure like, and lesser for lesser terms like garbage food and just like caffeine like when you actually eat vegetables and eat like uh well grilled meats if meat if you do eat meat you'll just feel the difference and you're you're less likely to get agitated less likely to snap at people less and then you can also retain more when you're studying so it's definitely key for me yeah i i i'm gonna piggyback off a little bit because it's, i did try that for a week because i am a coffee holic I, from the moment I wake up to the moment I go to sleep, if it's not hot coffee, it's iced coffee. And it keeps me, I guess, a little more hyper than usual. So I try to be that so-called perfectionist and make sure I do everything. So then I have more time to do other things and then I just get overwhelmed. So I said, you know, something has to change. So I started drinking, you know, water because I'm really not the, the greasy food type of person. I don't eat out like that. You know, I love my vegetables, whether they're frozen or I make them myself, you know, it, it, it balanced me out. And then I cut the caffeine to decaf for a little bit, but I had to get my body used to it because I would feel down since I was always so hyperactive. You know, I've always been like that since from birth. So I was told by my parents, I couldn't sit still. I always had to do something. And, um, I tried what you said, and it is true. If you eat healthier, take your vitamins, go out for a walk, opposed to just sitting all day due to this pandemic, it doesn't make it any easier. You know, it makes it harder because all you're doing is being home, consuming food, doing the same routine over and over again. It's like a revolving door. You wake up, you watch TV, you eat, you go to sleep, you do your classes, you know, sometimes... I wish I had that luxury, which I don't because I'm constantly every day, all day. Like today, you would think I would wake up later and do no. It's like my, my body's so immune to getting up early that it's just a routine. But sometimes you got to just lean to the left a little bit, or I should say to the right, and, and do take some time for yourself and prepare yourself because I also... Like Maria said, Mr. Hayda, I do my best work under pressure, but sometimes it takes a toll on you, you know, because you, you, 
example, for me, let me give you an example. Like last semester, I gave my papers in, but I gave them to the different, to the wrong professors, you know? So they called, they looked at me and they're like, excellent paper, but what does that have to do with the course you're taking? And I'm like, oh, shit. oh shoot. I, and then I was like, I'm so sorry, professor. So I switched it, but yeah, just thought I should put that in there. I went back to my mind though. I, because I, I can't, I, I mean, not that I can't, I, for right now, I choose not to, but once the semester's over and I, you know, I'll have some me time. No, I, I really appreciate your, your input. And then, especially with what you were saying about caffeine and uh, Kendall also in the chat said that caffeine or coffee is her lifeline as well. It's a compromise. It's not going to be perfect because I need, you need something. And I was, I'm a coffee addict too. When it's, when it's crunch time, just got, constantly going. And back then I also smoked cigarettes. So not that I'm condoning that, but that was my lifeline to keep going. Especially yeah. this. I'm a Newport yeah. hundred type of girl too. But then since last year I did, I'm doing the vibe, which yeah. is the same thing, but not the, the flavored one. Cause that's bad. They said it gives you popcorn lungs. Yeah. So no. I'm not justifying it either, you know, to who's his own, but I do the menthol or the mint. And it's just like, it's an extra boost. And then, but I, you had to compromise so somewhere. So my compromise was to try to eat healthy. I knew I wasn't sleeping. I knew I was burning myself out. I knew I needed coffee and my go and just eating, eating at least healthy for the, during that time that I was really pushing myself was my way of compromising and trying to find something that worked. And it's not for everyone, but that's what worked for me. Kendall also said B12, um, like going back to vitamins, that's very healthy as well. I, I do take a lot of vitamins that I can I wish say. I wish I was that. I do take my vitamins every morning, every Good. single day. <laughs> I hear it's very, it's very clutch and very important. I just, I would always just hope to get, uh, get my vitamins from eating like spinach every day and doing that, that healthy, um, that binge health eating that I would do. And that, and that was always my hope. Maybe that's what was in the science of it. That's probably why I felt so much better and would get through it, but I'm not, yeah. I'm not that bright with science. So, but I could just only assume. Here, here. <laughs> we all have our weak points and our strengths. We figure it out. But knowing um, the keys to success for uh, the finals and not just finals, just at tackling any, um, uh, I guess, crunch time or any stress in our life, especially when there's like expected goals and uh, numbers to meet, uh, it's knowing where you stand. Uh, you'll see that these, all these keys kind of intertwine each other. How do you know, you, does everyone in this uh, room uh, know where they stand with their grades currently? Yes. You know okay. And then how, how do you know that? Because I'm passing my classes <laughs> and I took my midterms already. So, and I don't miss classes. You know, the only problem I have with the keys to success, which I'm trying to work really hard on is time management. Yeah. That is, mm, that's a big one for me. Oops, sorry. Yeah, now it's a big problem for a lot of, I mean, I, a lot of us, including myself, and I just say a lot of us from experience of having the other workshops and just seeing how time management is a common problem a common trend of a, an area where we all need to improve. And I think that always just go for the rest of us with our lives. It always can be better. It takes practice. But um, with knowing where you stand, how do you know where your grades are, Eva? Does, do you have like a, your own tally system or do you talk with your professors? Um, I stay in contact with my professors. And then what I do is because some of them do give you um, – like to go over what we speak about and then we take ourselves a little quiz just to make sure that you have a better perspective of what is being taught which is really good I, I can't complain the professors I've had have been very encouraging uh very understanding and they see that you give your all they give their all you know, it, it, it's, I've been blessed. I've been very blessed. No, I'm glad to hear that. And you then, know, with, with my professors. And then if I, I reach out to them and if I don't understand something, I let them know from the door. So I'm not, a, I'm not, my math is not my best subject. So, you know, I, I took a suggestion, I did the tutoring and it's helped out a lot. So when I take my practice tests or when we have homework, it gives you, like, you go into your canvas of whichever professor or whatever class you're taking, and they give you this called, I think, quick help, and it explains, you know, there's different forms of explaining, like, the problem when it comes to math, and, you know, it gives you a breakdown, so I get a better understanding of it, 
And then I do ask my professors and they're like, Miss Sane, you have nothing to worry about. You're doing perfectly fine. Just keep doing what you're doing. And if you have any questions or if you need more time in you know, preparing or doing something, please don't hesitate to ask. So, you know, that's really cool because sometimes we let our pride get in the way if you don't understand something or you're in front of, you know, your classmates, you might think, oh my God, they're going to think this about me and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, no answer or question is a stupid question. It's when you don't ask that you don't learn. True. You know, that's, so. that's philosophy right there. Words of wisdom. And just Thank to use, you. just to use Eva as an example, um, that was what I was getting at. Communication is key. That's how you find out everything, where you stand what needs to be done in your classes. And even if like, as Eva was saying, if sometimes you may, especially in the in-person setting, where you might be embarrassed that it's a bad, you think it's a bad question or anything of that nature, that's what communication is all about. You shouldn't feel that way, but you can't sometimes fight feelings. So communicate with your professor, send an email after class, anything to just um, be, talk with your professor. And another thing that Eva did state that is very important, uh, showing you care. When professors, nine out of 10 professors you meet, if you show you them, show them that you care, They'll be more than they'll be more likely and more inclined to go out of their way to help you and meet you halfway, if not more than halfway. But when you don't care, and a lot of the professors, you ask them, like, I know I have to communicate with some professors with students who are struggling courses. The professor will just say, I, I haven't heard from the students since the first week of class. You ask them, um, is there anything the student can do? And usually they're not that responsive because the, the student hasn't showed they cared and hasn't reached out to the professor. So that's very key at communicating. And when you communicate, know where you stand, then you'll have a plan of attack, especially when the crunch time of finals, you'll know by communicating a professor, like what grade do I have? What grade do I need to have, keep or have on the final or on this final paper to maintain whatever average I have? And, or what's gonna be on this final? What should I uh, review? Having a plan, communicating, then once you have that plan, you know how to manage your time, especially not in that class, but also with the other courses you have, especially with the, um, those of us who have other responsibilities, whether it's uh, our own children, taking care of sick family members, multiple jobs, you know how to manage your time and have that plan of attack, especially with uh, finals. So then you know how to use which study strategies. Hopefully by this time, you kind of know what works for you. If not, well, I'll give you kind of a crash course at the end of a, a research and proven method. It's not for everyone, but it is a, it generally does seem to work for most of us, at least when it's, we have no other, and when we don't know that much about our methods, it's kind of, we can force on ourselves and make it work. And then um, the two big things is taking care of yourself. That was we briefly discussed in the beginning and uh, managing your anxiety. Cause sometimes anxiety is just, it's there. It's the fear of the unknown. It's just something you can't escape. So just, you don't know how you're going to do on the finals or your paper or how the rest of the semester is going to work or if all your hard work is going to pay off. So there's always that anxiety. We'll discuss about how, certain ways to cope with that. And then key of bringing it all together and just being prepared. Once you've done everything you can, there's no point in fretting. You're just, you did everything going to be prepared and you just, you do what you prepared yourself to do and trained yourself to do and, uh, for lesser terms. Any questions or anyone care have anything to share? Um, mostly think this semester, every time, like every time I get like a good grade on a test or quizzes or lab simulation, my physics grade on campus goes low and I explain it to my professor he said, so far I got 95 in the midterm. And then during class, he said, I'm doing good. And saying that how I'm like the highest, I have like a, I think I have a 90 something in that class. Awesome, congrats. Thanks. Keep it going, almost there, We're almost at the finish line. Mm -hmm. So let's talk. Um, this is just, I wanna summarize just quickly about communication. I mean, some of us may be in person classes, but I think the majority of us are going to be on Zoom and possibly still some of us are online courses. And a lot of students I've spoke with, um, it's sometimes difficult, whether it's their schedule or there's just a lot of people at the end of class that stick around in Zoom and it doesn't feel as personal as talking to the teacher in person. So these are just uh, some email tips. Uh, when emailing a teacher, always include your full name and class period and course. I just decided to use Mr. Lowe here as an example, Jose Lowe. Uh, uh, Monday, Wednesday, 1.32.50, the time, and then the actual class. It makes the professor see your email more. When they see where everything that's in front of them, they don't have to do any research. They're more inclined to respond promptly to your email when you have everything organized and upfront. In the subject, include the class, the course title and number and purpose of email. Another example, uh, the subject here would be bio123, essay extension request. 
professor knows what you're asking, they'll be more inclined to just respond right away to that and have a quick response for you. Use a formal salutation always um, just to keep it professional. When you, uh, when you are professional and treat others with respect, they're more likely to do the same for you. Uh, be clear and set a positive tone when, not if. I always say that, that just when, especially when typing, because sometimes it's text messages and emails can be confusing because you don't quite hear, uh, you're not there to experience a person's tone. So with that being said, you want to use positive words and like more reinforcing, reinforcing words. Like when you get a chance, professor, or um, when you're done with class today, not uh, if, if you have a chance or if, if um, you have a few aren't too um, busy, just so you, those ifs always leave that possibility of like openness. So when talking to just professors, just anyone, just when, just that positive uh, wording can go such a long way that you don't even realize. It's definitely psychological. And then including background and purpose of your email. Um, I'll show an example in the next slide and always use a proper closing. If we were to start out professional, always finish, always finish strong and professional. Like best regards, sincerely. I look forward to your reply. Here's just a quick example um, to who I'm sending it to. Uh, Dr. Fiji just made a quick name up at HCC. In the subject, you'll see, oh, my fault. You'll see the uh, subject or the course, uh, the course name and number. And then you'll see section five question five, or section, yeah, section five question about essay. So you have the section in the email or in the subject heading. And then you also have what the purpose of the email is in the, in the subject heading. And then you have dear Professor uh, Fiji, a very professional intro. I'm a student in your intro to poly science class. I have a question about the essay due next Thursday and I was not able to find the answer on the syllabus. Should our essay draw only on the readings listed on the syllabus or can I incorporate scholarly articles that I read on my own as long as it fits with the subject assignment? So it's very direct, short and sweet. Um, I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, very a professional closing, best regards. And then I have my name, my class subject and the days and times we meet. So that's just a, um, in textbook, a uh, very solid email gets your point across and most likely nine out of 10 times your professor will respond promptly to that. Any questions, anything anyone wants to share or has uh, maybe suggestions of something that I might've missed in this email that's worked for them? All right, no worries. So know your peak time, managing your time. Time management is very key and peak time, does everyone know what their peak time is or what a peak time is uh, the definition. Feel free to chat it. I can call on someone. How about uh, Victoria? You care to share what peak time is or what you think it might be? All right, no worries. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, peak time. I'm gonna... A, I'm assuming that it's like, I guess the time you're most available to like get your assignments done or study. Okay. And, then, and by available, what do you mean? Just that's the less time of the day or is that like the time that you function at your best? Yeah. Like the time you find, like in my personal opinion, like I function better around like five or six at night. Cause I feel like I'm done with like my work. I'm done with classes. So like from five on, I just do like my assignments and I study and all that. Awesome. No, thank you for sharing. And, and Ken, as you were, as Victoria was stating what, uh, what she believed in was correct, what her peak time is, Kendall also said it is the time of the day you do work best. So thank you, Kendall. That was hundred percent. And as Victoria was saying, she's a nighttime person or an evening. That's when she does her best work. Not only is she mentally uh, at her, at her um, firing on all cylinders and I guess the best way to put it, she also, that's a time in her day that's also available that she can able, has free time to do whatever she needs to get done. I'm assuming towards more so towards schoolwork. So when you're working, when your mind's best on that time of day and you have that available time, that's a two for two. And that's a definitely perfect peak time. Ken also said hers is usually in the morning. She gets a lot of uh, stuff done when she wakes up early. That's how I used to be. Um, but like with life and then having uh, my, my daughter now and everything, I've kind of been forced to make myself a really late night person. But eventually you get, you kind of kind of work with what you have. And I learned to just kind of build myself up to be able to be mentally at the best time at night when that's available, I'm the most available. So just the way it works sometimes. Um, I sometime, whether it is class or whether it's during class or when I'm break, I sometimes do my work like 
Friday, I like yesterday, I finished, since I have a class on Friday, what I do is just that we don't talk, we don't do like the class thing. We, I finished two of my bio homework and an essay that is due. So sometimes I finish that, I do that on Friday or work on it on Thursday. Or oh, mostly so just wake up in the morning, just do it before class. Oh, so sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off at the end, but Hayami brought up a really good point. So you have, those are your peak, not just times a day, you're actually peak days. So you even have days that you know that you would work your best for your schedule. So that's, that's awesome too. If you can, if you have, that's even, even uh, zeroing it down even more, you know what days of the week that are work best for you, you know what times of that day can work and when you function at your best. So that's awesome. And then um, avoid procrastination, not just throughout your days, but especially at your peak time. Best ways to avoid procrastination is put the phone away. If you can, I mean, understand some of us have family members and we have to always be on call, but try to limit it as much as possible, uh, maybe on vibrate or maybe put the phone away for 10 minutes and then know to check it by looking maybe at the clock on your uh, laptop or some technique. I mean, some of us aren't fortunate enough where we can just totally remove the phone from our, um, our, our vision or our um, proximity. But if you're able to do so, highly encourageable not only do you have the, the distraction of other people that can help you procrastinate, maybe it'll be something will come up that you're interested in, whether it's a sports, a celebrity, a movie, and it's just that much more easier to get distracted when you have the world basically at your fingertips. Um, the Pomodoro technique, um, uh, I see Eva, that's also, she's a nighttime person as well. At the, um, thank you for sharing that. At, uh, with the Pomodoro technique, it's just a, a proven um, time management strategy when you actually are able to like find your peak time and actually settle down. It's um, basically what it is, is you'll have an egg timer or a cell phone timer, some kind of timer where you'll put 25 minutes of work in, whether it's for studying or working on a paper or some kind of assignment. And once that 25 minute alarm goes off, you take a five minute break, whether it's just doing like maybe sit-ups, push-ups, maybe just going for a quick walk outside, whatever you need to do. Like if you need to unwind your body or unwind your mind or both, whatever you need to do in those five minutes, do it. Come back, do another 25 minutes, have that timer set. When that timer goes off, no matter what you're doing, try to make that break. Like if you even see like you're someone that can't stop in the middle of reading a paragraph or writing a paragraph, just see where your time is at and just know that, try to get it to that point where you're just, you know you need to stop just so there's no interruption. You can keep on this pattern because it's part of keeping the strict pattern is what is like for, at the study has proven to be psychologically, this is how it's effective by being practicing this and sticking to a strict, uh, I say regiment. And when you do this work 25 and break five minutes for four times, then you increase the cycle by doing uh, the next time you're going to do 10 minute breaks and you keep building on that. And that's a, it's like almost a risk reward system, or I would say risk reward, but a reward system for putting in the sticking to those 25 minute um, work intervals. And then also it's also building that kind of um, regiment within you and that discipline. So it has been proven to work. And some students I have talked to that have used this, it actually is really effective. And, but it's, again, not everything is for everyone. It works for everyone, but it does take practice. And if you found your style, definitely keep sticking to it. And then manage your priorities and always have goals. Just, it's very difficult, especially when you have a lot going on with work and families, but trying to start each week, like uh, uh, even just a written list or even on your like a digital calendar, especially this crunch time of finals and when papers and assignments are due, try to manage your prior priorities, especially, um, what is the most difficult even we'll get into that a little bit later but like if you're better at english than math you'll probably want to get the math out of the way first because you know you're gonna have the most challenge and at least me personally i know that when i have like a, a huge uh, slate or um to-do list of a lot of challenging tasks having that most difficult one at the end uh, it's not the best for me because i know i'm going to be burnt out i'm not going to give it my hundred percent especially when it's at the end so i tend to be work better when i have the easiest task at the end of my list anybody have anything to share or experiences all right i'll pick I'll, I'll call somebody out next uh on the next slide so i don't want to interrupt was somebody about to say something i was gonna say um i feel like i work backward i did the hardest thing first and then the easiest thing last because i know i'm gonna last longer with the um hardest thing yeah, um and then uh That's working today, sorry uh, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um and then the pull I, I don't know how to pronounce that word, Pomodoro technique. Yeah, Pomodoro. I think Pomodoro that's, how I, that's how I say it. And was, and was okay. taught. Um, with that, that actually, that I used to 
like I do that as well, especially when reading really heavy content that I have to read and I don't want to like lose myself. So I take a break and um, like a 15 minute break just to do something else and then go back again and continue. And for me, it works. It really works a lot. And it helps me to get through like a 40 page book that I have to read, like a lot of heavy content that I have to memorize. So that, that works for me. Appreciate it, Maria. But just to keep you on the spot on the spotlight real quick, Kendall put in the chat that sometimes she finds it hard to ha get the motivation to do the hardest stuff. That's her a big struggle for her. Is there anything that you could suggest? Or anybody feel free. It's not just Maria, but I just wanted to pick on her since she was just talking. Anybody have any um, advice for Kendall or at least maybe what's worked for them about how they can just how they get over that uh, that hump of like tackling or finding the motivation to start the most difficult task? I don't know. I always feel like the hardest part is getting started. So it's like, oh, how? Because it's like, once you already start, you're just going to keep going. So the hardest part is always writing the first page. So one thing that I try to do, I try to do an outline, like especially when writing paper. So I would just write an outline of, um, you know, okay, what am I going to write? What's going to be my point? And then once I keep going and brainstorm, I feel like, okay, now I know where to start. Cause it's always like that, that first initial page that it makes it hard cause you don't know where to start. So maybe creating like an outline might work. No, thank you, Maria. Did anyone have anything to add to that or agree with that or maybe even argue that? I mean, not argue, but maybe have a different view. Okay, I, I was honestly, good. I agree with Maria 100%. Um, when you break, getting that task started is very difficult but then if you're able to kind of break it down like on a list or even in your mind probably easier to write it out because it's when you have something written concrete in front of you it's more manageable and like it's like almost more motivating like you can actually see it and when you cross it off your list it's just that much more like um fulfilling that you know you're making a dent and whatever you're trying to tackle but yeah I, that would be probably the best one of the best ways at least i know of just visual uh, having it actually planned out and visualizing it and that makes it easily more easy to get started because you know that once you get that one done you have this many x amount more tasks to get done to make sure this whole whatever task or project is completed and just yeah getting started is the difficult part but when it's outlined for you that makes it all a uh, heck of a lot easier i see someone in the chat it's a good idea awesome a lot of people agreeing with them maria so i hope that helped kendall that's Studying. good <laughs> wealth of knowledge wealth of knowledge so studying tips, um, just quickly break through this. I just don't want to make sure we get all out of here by 430, but I don't want to discourage anyone from sharing or opening up. So please do so. Um, avoid marathon studying. I know it's easier said than done, especially when we're a lot of procrastinators, it sounds like, like myself and Maria, that um, we wait till the end. So that does kind of, it's almost impossible to avoid marathon studying. But if you can, if you can spread out your studying and not burn yourself out, it's definitely encouraged. Try to schedule breaks, just kind of what, the, what I was kind of preaching with the Pomodoro technique. Those five minute breaks, which tend to turn to 10 minute breaks are very key just to give yourself just that break because sometimes you just get overwhelmed. And if you're taking that much knowledge in without doing anything like taking a break, sometimes when you don't break, you don't realize things you need, like you need to drink water. You need, maybe you're hungry, you don't realize it. And this kind of is all just negative things that will add up to you not retaining as much knowledge as you could. Uh, using mnemonics, which is basically, um, here's just an example, like my very exceptional mother just served us nine pizzas. That kind of phrase will be a way to help remember the names of the planets in the order. So Mercury, Venus, Mars, et cetera, or Venus, Earth, Mars, et cetera. Some kind of technique or acronym even, that's what I've always used for like, to try to remember something. Like if it's like, um, I can't think of an example right now, but if you want to say like the, the five senses, some kind of clever acronym, like I, for, for those who don't know what an acronym is, it's like LOL, like laughing out loud or fat um, SMH, shaking my head. Something like some acronym like that, that can, you can relate to your studying or remembering like key facts to a certain subject that's helped me in the past. And then going to uh, physically taking care of yourself as a studying tip, eating well and sleeping well. Like I said, um, sometimes some of us have to compromise where we either have to pick one, either you're going to sleep, you're going to sleep well, which I I kind of find it hard. I mean, from my experience, that's one of the hardest ones to get. So you probably have to take the exception and uh, compromise and eat well during that time. Or maybe some of us have that spare time where we can do the self-care and put more emphasis on self-care and taking care of ourselves during the week by just uh, making sure that we're relaxed and doing things we enjoy while also making sure we're productive towards our schoolwork. And then key, another key is finding a good place. 
always a, a place removed from distractions. I know it's been a little difficult for a lot of us with uh, the COVID um, uh, pandemic as a lot more people are home than usual. So privacy is not the most easily accessible uh, resource, but if you can find that place, it's very encouraged. And then last but not least, SQR3, just a quick studying method that uh, some of us don't know how we learn or have studying methods. I'll just review that briefly, just so you may have something that you didn't know existed or never thought of, and maybe it will work for you. Any comments or suggestions? All right, awesome. Feel free to chat or um, unmute and then I'll be more than happy to give the floor to you. So, so reading and studying, um, reciting, we'll get through all what they actually stand for, but SQR3 as a here, survey, question, read, recite, review. It's a proven technique, sharpens your textbook skills and retention skills. Uh, you'll frequently be signed multiple chapters for several different courses, especially when you're coming to finals and you have to review everything for most finals that you've covered. And whether it's the whole semester or for like the, the second portion of the semester after finals, or sorry, after midterms, something that you're gonna have to do of uh, retaining a lot of information. And as this method just helps you make your reading purposeful and meaningful, so your time is most effective. And but the best way to make this work is by being an active reader and effective reader, not passive. And well, as we go through, uh, you'll see more of what that means. So the survey portion is you get an idea of what the chapter is about by reviewing the highlights quickly go through the chapter or section to see like as the beginning of each subsection of what the highlight is. Read the title headings and subheadings. Always take note of what's italicized or bold because that's gonna be some kind of important fact or important point. Always look at the pictures. I'm always a picture person. So anything you see a graph, there's a reason it's there. It's probably a big connection to what's being spoken within the text. So just seeing that visual, um, I guess evidence or that visual support is very effective because it also not only helps you by seeing that visual and what the information is in there, gets you an idea what the, about the, the text is about as well. Read the captions and also read the very beginning and the end of chapter. Like this is almost like this, call it the sandwich technique. You see, you read the two pieces of bread before you actually tackle what's in between the sandwich. Question, as you read the text, to the text, sorry, always ask a question for each section. Like maybe if it's gonna say about um, settler, like for um, world history one or like American history, like sed settlers uh, exploring um, the new land or America, just simply ask like, why, why are they asked? Why are settlers exploring the new land? So that kind of puts in your mind about information you'll be looking for to tackle. And it gives you, you're pretty much your reading right there off the bat has a purpose. You want to find out why, why this is, why these settlers came here, why this section is, why the, what, what this section is gonna be telling me about my question. And then uh, that was kind of an example of how to create the question by turning the title headings and subheadings into questions. Write these questions at the end of the ch chapter and after each subheading in your own words, kind of make, give yourself ownership of it. And writing down your questions will also help you later on, maybe when you go to summarize everything. When you have those questions, it might just like trigger something in your mind, you'll connect that moment in time that you remembered asking that question and how you answered it by reading the, fa the, the facts that were provided in the text. Read, read one section of your chapter at a time, actively looking, that active reading, always actively looking for the answer to whatever question you gave that section. Pay attention to the bold and italicized text. So get, you're also being active. You're looking for key, key words or key, key components to, that'll bring up important points. And be sure to review everything in the section, including tables, graphs, illustration, as all these features can communicate the idea more powerfully and make it stick in your mind. Recite. At the end of each section, look from the look uh, from the text and in your own words, recite an answer to your question. Just kind of summarizing almost. Just say like, what did I ask? What was my answer? Oh yes, and then restating it. And just keep that repeating that process. And then finally, re again, recite this all in your own words. Because when you put stuff in your own words and you say it in your own words, it gives you more of an ownership, makes you remember it, and it makes you just kind of have that command of it. Review, again, um, after you went through this process, always review the notes you wrote, your questions you wrote at the end of each chapter, and then your answers. Oops, sorry. So with that, so as you see, the SQR3 all goes full circle. Um, I'll, I'll be more than happy to, if this is something that people or uh, any of you students are interested in looking at or maybe, maybe want to try to use, I'll be more than happy to send this PowerPoint to you. So at the end, just let me know. Any questions on this or any ex shared experiences? Okay, no worries. Worrying our anxiety management, worrying in new ways. Um, again, I was to crash course on anxiety. Um, anxiety is just usually, not usually, it's 
pretty much what the definition is, is fearing the unknown, fearing what hasn't happened yet generally, or just feeling the pressure of things coming down on you and you're expecting the worst. So worrying in new ways is basically um, a CBT method, uh, it's cognitive, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is kind of just learning how to control your behaviors and your thoughts and emotions. Easier said than done, but this is a simple uh, CBT method. You catch your assumptions and you identify uh, logic. Uh, the best example I can give is like public speaking because it's some fear that a lot of people share and ha can have experience one time in their life. And what's your fear of public speaking? Generally, you think you're going to fail. You think you're going to stutter. You think you're going to get nervous and have a panic attack and you're not going to be able to do your speech. But honestly, out of it has happened, yes. But it, honestly, the catching the assumption is you think to yourself, like, how many times has this actually happened to me? Have I, have I actually been so bad where I freeze and then I, I don't finish and I fail that? Usually not. Usually you have cards, index cards that kind of help you through. I'm not saying it's going to be a perfect speech. Maybe you struggle a little bit, but you do get through it. So you do catch that assumption like, I am thinking the worst case scenario, but I've gotten through every speech I've gotten up to this point. So you're then identifying the logic. Well, I do have my index cards. I did practice in a mirror before my speech. So most likely this is not going to be as bad as I think. So I just use public speaking as a, like I said, a general example, but you can use this for a lot of things, not just in school, just always catching that assumption that you think is going to happen or you think the you always naturally think the worst, but then try to remove yourself from that moment and identify the logical sol solution and the logical outcome. Cause like this has happened to me before, how did it work out? It pretty much worked out in a positive way or it worked out not as bad as I said. So you're just replacing that irrational fear with a rational outcome. Uh, a technique of relaxing, breathing, mindfulness, meditation, and grounding. I mean, not a technique that all kind of is comes full circle. Um, Mindfulness is just being in the aware of the here and now. Meditation is a way to um, really emphasize the mindfulness. You can't really meditate without being mindful. And um, it's all uh, maintained through breathing for, the, for some of those like myself who are uh, amateurs or novices in meditation. Breathing is uh, very key. It's, it's physical. And once you pay attention, uh, bring your attention to something that's physically happening to you, you can then uh, control your mind to focus on that. So taking deep breaths. Um, one example we, I always go to is box breathing. It's uh, you visualize a box and you can even draw with your finger where you inhale for five seconds. Then you exhale for five seconds, or sorry, you, my, my apologies. You inhale for five seconds. So you go across one box, then you hold it. Then you go down the side of the one box for about five seconds, exhale for five seconds, and then hold that for five seconds. And you keep repeating that cycle for your breathing until you finally find yourself calm and meditate it. And then when you're doing this breathing exercise, you can even do something called grounding, which is really good for those who have uh, panic attacks. It's basically using your senses and saying, okay, what are five things I see in the room now? What are four things I smell? Three things I touch, two things I taste, and one thing I hear. It doesn't have to be in that order, but just trying to get your, make sure that all your senses are appealed to and that you, by appealing to your senses, you kind of remove yourself or in your mind, whatever that is uh, overcoming you with anxiety. And it's a very good way to kind of control your anxiety. And um, way to uh, also control anxiety is people. The people you keep around you, the company you keep. If you're around a lot of negative people and a lot of people that practice dangerous habits, whether it's um, self-medicating with drugs, recreational drugs, or like to do a lot of... Um, not that, not that being going out and having fun with your friends, especially if you're drinking at age and going out, it's not, it's not negative, but when you do it all the time and it becomes a crutch for you, that could become toxic. Just identifying toxic things and toxic people is very key to um, reducing anxiety and controlling your anxiety. Just try to find yourself and surround yourself with positive people. Cause when they're positive, usually people that are around them are positive and you want those vibes. You want those good vibes in your life. Um, be aware, uh, accept your anxiety. Just realize that you do have anxiety watch your anxiety by sometimes giving yourself a Likert scale. By that, I mean like 10 is bad, one is great. So I'm feeling anxious right now. I'd say I'm at a five. So it's not the worst anxiety I've ever had. Act with that anxiety then after you, you watch it, monitor it. Um, basically by acting with it, it's like faking it till you make it. Just saying like, I'm anxious right now for this speech, but I'm going to power through it because I know I've, I've gotten through every speech before this. So I, I'm confident, I'm, I got this. And then you just repeat that method and then I always expect the best. And then lifestyle change, whether it's eating, uh, negative people around you, whatever that is, lifestyle change is very, when, you, when you're finding yourself over or being greeted with anxiety and overcome with anxiety every day, that should be a telltale sign that there's something in your life that has to change. 
It's not easy, but that's at least a red flag to you that if you're experiencing this, and this experience, this is frequently where it's happening every day or multiple times in one day, it's probably time to get some uh, professional help or just some help. And even if you can't have access, whether it's financial or time to professional help, at least as a, a band-aid or something that's close to you, find something you can trust or you do trust and just even share. Because when you share, you realize a huge weight is lifted off you. And it's very important to share with others because then maybe that person experienced the same thing you're going through and might have the, the solution that worked for them, maybe the same solution that worked for you. I know I've been uh, kind of uh, mumbling and, and hogging the attention here in the, the microphone. Anyone have anything to share? Or want anything they would possibly um, can relate to? Um, mostly when I'm nervous for a presentation, like there's a, a presentation at one with Ms. Tejo and Ms. Alona tonight and Ms. Maria about the project. I was nervous at first. Then I got through it. And sometime when I get nervous on a quiz, I just like, I usually bite my nails. Mostly that's like every day when it's exams or quizzes or my grades. So you're telling me you generally don't have any fingernails? <laughs> no. <laughs> I but have no. fingernails. So just like sometime I get nervous or sometime. When it's about a quiz that we're going to take, I'm not ready for it. I usually either scratch my arm or you like bite my nails or sometimes I stress eat, but I don't stress eat anymore because I only got, I only got candy and just junk food. So sometimes just go to the 7-Eleven and get a cold, get cold pressed juice, like the green juice and get some yogurt so I could like feel, so be like, fine for me oh that's awesome no thank you i appreciate you staring at me and anyone else can relate i know i i stand a lot when i got when i got a lot going on my mind i got a pace i'm like a stander and pacer i i make i make when i'm nervous i make other people nervous i'm told so i'm not a good person to be around when i'm nervous anybody else have any similar similar kind of uh habits they realize when they're anxious all right no worries so self-maintenance, self-care. Uh, I just did the picture of like taking care of a car because that's just a visual a metaphor. Like we're like a car. If you don't take care of yourself and do the fine tune-ups, you're not going to, you're, you're going to crash. You're not going to go for long distances. If you don't change your oil or watch your tires or make sure that you have gas in your car, your car's not going to get too far. It's eventually going to break down. Same with us as people. Uh, ways, quick ways to um, self-care are asking for help, uh, spending time alone, um, just I like to just emphasize that spending time alone, sometimes spending a lot of time alone can also have a negative aspect, depending on what mentality you're in. Uh, if you're like antisocial and you just keep pushing people away, not because you're busy and have to get things to do, but like you just don't want to be around people that can be unhealthy. And if you notice yourself doing that, definitely seek help, uh, whether it's just talking to a professional or just a friend, just those are when you just from even personal experience of myself and dealing with friends who went through a lot of different things. Some friends even of mine took their own lives. Those are definitely telltale signs when people are becoming reclusive to a point where there's no reason. Like it's not like they're working a lot or have to get a lot done. It's just it's an emotional thing or emotional situation to put themselves in. It's a red flag. And just if you even if it's not happening to yourself, you've seen it happen to somebody, try to reach out to them because it's like I said, it is a it is a flag. Putting yourself first, sometimes just um, saying no to people. I know it's not easy, especially for like someone like me. I always like helping others, but sometimes you have to put yourself first. And if you don't take care of yourself, we forget that, that you're not going to be good to anyone else. You're going to be burnt out. You might be, even if you're not burnt out physically, you'll be just snapping at people if you're just mentally not recharged. And it's just, if you're not good for you, you're not good for anyone else. Asking for what you need, giving that conversation to yourself. Self-talk, if it's positive especially positive affirmations, starting the day off by looking in the mirror and saying, today is going to be a good day. No matter what gets in my way, I'm going to make sure I'm not going to let it bring me down. Just putting that uh, initial positive and like putting the, raising the bar high for the day and setting the tone can be very good uh, of a, a very good method because it's a very uh, 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 it's positive mentality. It could go a really long way. Same kind of intertwines with taking a step back and kind of just smelling the roses and taking everything in, staying at home, these are all just keys with key ways and little pointers and the tips to how to really uh, emphasize self-care for yourself. Um, five senses, um, like I said the, before, kind of when you have these panic attacks or just when you don't know how to be mindful and you're feeling stressed, 
appealing to all these senses, like going to a park and sitting near the water, or going to the beach, somewhere you like to be and being able just to appease all these senses and be at peace is very positive. Uh, just see the person here doing yoga in the picture. I don't know how to do yoga. I think I have personally too much ADD to do yoga, but I hear for those who do practice, it's very therapeutic. And my form of yoga is kind of walking out in, the, in nature, paddle boarding on the ocean, surfing, anything that puts me in nature where I'm removed from most, as most much people and stress as I can be is my kind of meditation or my form of yoga. And then let's make a plan. Um, talk before you walk. I'm just, this is kind of where we bring it all together. Um, we create our reality with action. You can think of all these great things and all these plans you want to do in life and have these goals you have, but they're never going to, you're never going to achieve them without action. My always favorite quote was make one day or, you know, make, you know, make one day, day one, make today, make whatever, instead of thinking like one day I'll do this one day I'll do that. Make it today. You have to start somewhere. So make today the first day, plan your path, uh, manage your time, manage your schedule, rules of engagement. Um, actually act on that management study, put the effort in. Uh, de-stress the distressed, find ways to overcome your anxiety and cope. We're all going to encounter anxiety, some of us more often than others. It's just nature, it's just natural, especially being a student and tackling on, taking on so many responsibilities and tackling so many uh, responsibilities. Um, just going to have to learn, find every, there's no cure-all for everyone. You have to find what method works best for you and it takes practice. And a better you is a better result. So when you take care of yourself, and you're, and you're good to go, you're good for everyone else, and you can tackle whatever obstacles are in your way with that much more efficiency. Any questions? I know I kind of rushed through those last couple slides, but I wanted to make sure I didn't go over the 430 mark and hold anyone up. But feel please feel free to share now in the chat or just if you want, this is an open message board, feel free. I'll even turn off the the recording if, if this will make everyone more comfortable.